welcome from uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, for us, it's a very comfortable uh, just after 7.30 in the evening here in Singapore, but we know that we've got uh, people on the far side of the world who've managed to get up at uh, 7.30 in the morning or perhaps even uh, earlier. And so uh, wherever you are, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's really good that we are able through these story swaps to connect with people. So while we are geographically distant, we can at least come together for this short time and share our common love of stories. So tonight we are, or rather in this session, our theme is riddle tales. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm not sure how much uh, head scratching we'll uh, be doing, but uh, we're certainly looking forward to uh, hearing the stories. And we're going to start off uh, with someone who's going to be making their uh, uh, debut, I think. Uh, Pankuri, hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? And uh, good. so it is your first time, right? Tell the story. Yes. At least. yes. Yeah, yes. good. And yes. welcome. We love it when this happens. I have attended um, the swaps, but just as an audience. Well, that's great. You know, this is, this is good. And where are you in, in India? So I, be, I belong to Raipur. It's a, a place in Chhattisgarh. It's a small state. Mm, okay, very good. And, I, and uh, are you working as a storyteller? Not really. I have a preschool. I, I tell, keep telling stories all the time uh, as a counselor and as an okay. educator. Yeah, mm. that's right. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, please, why don't we... Uh, Get this swap going uh, with your story, please. Sure. So good evening, everyone. I'm Pankhuri, and I would like to start with the sort of little two lines of a song. So here goes my song. Bal bal jao me tore rang rajwa tore rang rajwa. Apni si rang di ni si mohe nena me laike mohe suhagan ki ni me mo se nena me laike chhap tilak sab chhi ni re mo se nena me laike So this song uh, is written in the Braj dialect which is spoken in Uttar Pradesh. And it's written by a Sufi milk, Amir Khusro. And this song is even sung today. So there are few reasons why I sang the song. One is because the story comes from Uttar Pradesh. And it is a land of the majestic Ganga Jamuna rivers, the magnificent rivers that give life to its people. And uh, it is also a land that uh, it has a smooth, uh, seamless fusion of the Islamic and the Hindu traditions, and which is called Hindustani. Uh, so this is a great testimony and legacy to the great Mughal king, Muhammad Jalaluddin Akbar, who ruled India in the 16th century. And uh, the story is about, sort of about him and his minister. So, so this... Uh, he ruled India from this empire he had, and the capital city was Patepur Sikri, which is in Agra, which is in Uttar Pradesh. And he was an illiterate king. He was never formally educated, but he was a patron of arts, music, and literature. And sort of the Hindustani culture is sort of born, uh, like born from there. And he had these nine ministers, the nine jewels of his crown, which are called the Navratnas. So one of them was Mahesh Das. Now Mahesh Das belonged to one of the uh, small villages around that, uh, the, the Agra area. And uh, he was, he's famously known as Veervar, which is the brave one. And uh, commonly he's known as Birbal. So Birbal was the favorite of King Akbar for many reasons. He had great qualities. He had the presence of mind. He has wit. He had humor. He advised the king uh, in a very wise way. 
but the most imp- uh, the most enduring quality for the king was that he loved listening to stories and anecdotes and poems and mahesh das that is birbal entertained him with all these beautiful stories and he was a poet himself he used to write poetry in braj language which is the local dialect over there and uh, he was a constant companion and a confidant to the king king really listened to him so this is little background i wanted to give and one fine morning the king decided when he woke up that he wanted to take a walk in his royal palace gardens of the fatehpur sikri palace so he, as he strolled out on his leisurely walk the soft green grass beneath his feet felt so pleasant and the fruit trees surrounding the garden were like they were ripe with the fruits and the aroma of the fruits were coming through the the cool breeze filling his senses and just giving him so much pleasure now the royal gardens the mogul gardens are really famous they have these neatly trimmed lawns uh and you can see them as far as the eye can Uh, see they are stretching as far as the eye can see and uh, they are having these fountains magnificent fountains are around the flowers are blooming the birds are singing their melodious music and the butterflies are are flying from bush to bush and that is what the king was engrossed in and he was having a wonderful leisurely walk through his gardens as he decided to walk towards the fountain which was located at the center of the garden and a pathway that led to the fountain he was in his reverie just enjoying the surroundings and suddenly he was he broke out of his reverie because a hard something hard had hit him on the toe he looked down to see there was a big rock on the path and his toe hurt really bad he screamed ouch and and he he was he was horrified to see that that big co- uh, rock that was the size of a coconut lying down on the path so he got really very very angry and as he, everyone knows that the akbar also was famous for his horror, his his uh, anger and nobody in the ministers or in the court wanted to provoke his royal majestic anger because once it was provoked it, nobody was going to be saved so now he was very angry he ordered his assistants to come and find that man who was responsible for spoiling the beauty of his gardens he was uh, they were ordered to go and find that man who was responsible at once so everyone just ran and looked for that man and in a short while they were able to find that man and he was brought to court in front of the king and he was the head gardener of the royal palace so the king looked at him and he said are you the one who is responsible for this horrible act and spoiling my garden and and hurting me like this now the gardener could not say anything he just joined his hand he bowed low and he said i'm really really sorry this is i i i will try not this to not happen ever again this was my carelessness but please 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 forgive me this just this one time and he pleaded and cried but the king would have none of it he did not hear the gardener he ordered the gardener to be executed in a day or two and he was sent to the prisons and he was to be hanged so now when birbal came to know about this as we as we mentioned earlier as i mentioned earlier birbal he, he was witty humorous but he was also a very wise and a just man his sense of justice was really strong so when he came to know about this tragic affair he he did not want that poor gardener to be executed and he hatched a plan in his mind and he wanted to save this man because he knew that this man was a very loyal faithful servant he was very talented and after all he was the one who was responsible for this beautiful royal palace gardens 
So he went down into the prison and he spoke to this man. And he called him near and he said something really softly in his ears. And he said, whatever he said, the gardener's face after that was like ashen, pale, white. The color had vanished off his face. He was so, so scared. He just looked at Birbal speechless and he said with a look in his eyes that are you really telling me what I'm hearing? Is it really, you really mean what you're saying? Do I really have to do this? But Birbal said that this is your last chance to save your life. And if you want to save your life, you must listen to my instructions carefully and follow what I'm telling you. Again, the gardener absolutely had no choice. So he just joined his hand and looked at Birbal with this pleading look in his face that you are the one who can save me. And please, please, please save me. And then Birbal went away. And the day of the hanging was there. It arrived. And that was the day that he, the gardener, was asked, what is your last dying wish? Please tell, before you are being executed, we want to fulfill your last wish. That was the custom in those days that the person who was to die, his wish had to be fulfilled. The gardener thought a little and then he said, I just want a two minute audience with the king, with the great emperor. I want to see him one last time. Now, of course, he could not be refused because that was his last wish. So he was bathed, cleaned. He, may, he was made to wear clean clothes. And two guards held him. And he was taken into the royal, royal darbar of the king. The darbar with the, mag the magnificent, splendid chandeliers and the beautiful curtains and the silk carpets in front of him. And the king was in a very important meeting with his ministers in the Darbar Hall. As the gardener was taken into the gallery that led to the throne of the king, he was walking slowly with his head down. But suddenly, the gardener broke loose from the guards and he ran towards the throne of the king to attack him. He was about to attack the king when the guards ran and caught hold of him. The whole Darbar was speechless. The murmurs of disbelief could be heard everywhere. People stood up from their places. And the king, the king, he was shocked. He was trembling with rage. And he did not know how to react. For a moment, he was just shocked. And after that, he, he took hold, held over hold of himself. He stood up and he asked the gardener. He, he just was too curious. He had to ask. So he asked the gardener, what did you just do? What were you thinking? How dare you attack the great Mughal king, me, King Akbar? But the gardener, he did not say anything. He just turned back at the ministers who were sitting there and he looked at Birbal. He just looked at Birbal and the king also followed his gaze and looked at Birbal. Birbal stood up from his chair and he walked towards the king's throne. He came up to the king and he whispered something really softly in the king's ears. And to everyone's surprise and shock, after that, the king had a smile on his face and he had forgotten all about his anger and he ordered the guards to leave the gardener and let him go home. He just ordered the gardener to be sent home. Now the courtiers were really curious and wondering what did Birbal say to his courtiers, to, uh, to the king, that he, he just let the gardener go. And that's the question I want to ask. Uh, can you guess what Birbal must have said to the king? They're all scratching their heads. Oh, dear me. 
Anybody want to, to have a go? And there's lots of I, people who are not showing. You could put it in the chat as well. If you're, there's lots of people whose videos are not, not showing. If you want to put it in the chat. I don't want to be the spoil sport. Oh, you know the, <laughs> I know the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you know the answer, yeah. don't do it. <laughs> that's, that's the problem with it with riddles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming back to uh, join us. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. So um, what's the story you've got for us today? Yeah. So the story that I have you for today is I really don't know the source of the story. I remember hearing it in Coimbatore, my hometown, very long time ago uh, from a party, party as in an, a real old woman uh, from my grandfather's village. Um, so the names in the story is also something that I have uh, adapted, but I should warn you that this story has got a riddle that is very, very difficult. So let us see. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to, yes. So let me just, uh, shall I go, uh, Roger? Please, please. Yes. All right. Hmm. Ure 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 le ure ure rajyam ure ure rajyatil ure ure raja ure ure rajak ure sandegam tan mandiriyil yarda rumba vivegam rumba vivegam very long time ago in a kingdom where the rivers flowed, the flowers bloomed and the birds chirped. There lived a king who was very foolish, but thought that he was the most intelligent of everyone. And so from far and near, people came in, one with crooked hearts and cunning minds to make and loot money from this kingdom. Well, if you hear what people spoke in that kingdom, you will understand. They always said that the best place to be in the whole kingdom is in close proximity with the Raja for that will make you the richest in the kingdom. So it was not a big wonder to understand that it was the Raja Guru who was the most powerful and the richest in the entire kingdom. The poor people of the kingdom were waiting for solace praying for a positive change. They were in grief. They were crying and praying together for some kind of a miracle to happen. Well, the prayers that the people gave were definitely answered and help came through a little lad called Soman who promised to help all the people in distress. Hmm. To be in the court, holding a great position, a powerful position amongst the ministers was not that easy because the control there was with the Raja Guru. For anyone to enter the premises of the court, there is a very difficult question that will have to be answered and that which will be posed by the Raja Guru. Oh, but our sermon was a little different and he knew the trick. He went to the court and said, My dear Majesty, I'm told that the most intelligent person in this kingdom is you. Did I tell you that this king was so foolish, but he thought to be the most intelligent? And hence, my dear Lord, if there is a question that I will have to answer, I prefer it to be yours. I should tell you something. Flattery always works with fools. And so, without any doubt, the king acknowledged and gave a yes to 
so man's request but that night as he was walking in the queen's chambers he was fidgeting his fingers and walking up and down not knowing which question to ask soman the next morning the queen pitched in to help the queen said prabhu you know what if there is something going on in your mind i can tell you that i will be able to help for every time i choose my chief maiden i pose one difficult riddle to her and if she is able to answer that one difficult riddle i make her my chief maiden the king was at peace immediately the queen called her chief maiden mallika can you please come here mallika came running and the queen said can you answer the question that i had asked you during the interview now tell me mallika if your parents had three children one your brother the other your sister then who is the third child the king stood there perplexed not knowing the answer to the most difficult question in this whole world but then mallika blurted out so easily your highness it is me mallika va 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 no wonder my queen has appointed you as the chief maiden said the king and he was very happy and went to sleep in peace the next day morning the court was in session everybody was eagerly waiting to see what question the king would be asking soman he came and sat there he looked at soman and <clears throat> i just have one riddle for you my boy and if you are able to answer that riddle right i will make you the chief minister to this kingdom and everybody was eagerly waiting biting nails and looking at the king here is the question if your parents had three children one your brother the other your sister then who is the third child soman stood there pretending to be scared he looked at the king and he said my dear king what i heard is true you are the most intelligent in this whole kingdom and i really don't know i am at awe at your intelligence uh but i really think i know the answer to the question and he blurted out the answer the answer my dear king is mallika the queen's chief maiden bravo 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 i'm very happy he said and he ran to soman gave him a hug and said from today i appoint you to be the chief minister to this kingdom much to the dismay of rajguru and the other ministers who were present there who didn't understand the head or the tail of what was happening there in the court room little did they know that soman was spying in the queen's chamber the previous night and he exactly knew what the foolish king was expecting for an answer my dear friends long time ago in a kingdom where rivers flowed flowers bloomed and birds chirped there lived a king who was very foolish but the country flourished because for now they have the most intelligent chief minister ever ore 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 le ore ore raja ore ore raja vik ore ore mandiri mandiriya avare illa tandiri nana nane na nane 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 na nane nane na thank you oh if question right <laughs> if only we had such good advisors in politics today <laughs> yes indeed thank you and again it's just uh, I, i love the musical opening and closing to the song very very nice good i'm now going to uh, jump uh, a long way away 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 uh, all the way over to uh, toronto and uh, to greet norman how are you sir i'm doing well um let's Coffee uh, is the riddle that uh, solves the riddle of waking up, um, and so thank you, by the way, for um, accepting me into this. I really am looking forward to it. So thank uh, you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Well, it said very short. 
but um, there's a little bit of a preamble to it. Um, in the country, uh, in the continent of Africa, there's many um, stories that are told for entertainment, and they're in the form of uh, riddle stories, and they have many levels to them. I really enjoy them. So this particular one jumped out at me, and uh, I particularly enjoy it because there's a fellow storyteller who argues with me every time the, I give what's the answer to this um, riddle tale. So um, there are no set answers. They are meant to teach us how to think and how to argue, discuss, and know that there is no one answer to a problem. Once a long time ago, there was a beautiful young woman, and her name was Sangba. And it was time for her to be married, and all of the young men were uh, courting her. Fights broke out. There was a lot of contention. So the father decided, I will set a contest. I want my daughter to have the best husband possible, and therefore I will set this task for the man who will marry my daughter. My daughter will marry the one who comes back with a live living deer. Well, a lot of young men headed off into the forest and into the mountain, but none of them were fast enough to capture a deer. But two friends decided to take up the challenge, and so they went into the forest and up through the valleys and the mountain. And it was hard going. There were streams, there was brambles, bushes. The uh, deer would hear them coming from a mile off. Because they couldn't shoot the deer, they had to go and capture it. And finally, after a lot of scratches and struggle, one young man said, no woman is worth this. No woman is worth this at all, this trouble. And therefore, I'm going to rest underneath the tree. You can go on if you wish to his friend, but I will wait here for you to return. And his friend went on. And you know what? He caught the deer single-handedly. And there he was struggling with it, and his friend helped subdue the deer. And between the two of them, they carried it back, wiggling and jiggling between them. And as they came into the village, the father saw the two men, both carrying the deer. And he said, I said my daughter would marry the man who came back with the living deer. And here are two men, two men coming back with the living deer. I don't know which one should marry my daughter. And so he, gathered, he called the village elders who heard the story and from the, the young man said, well, my friend went and caught the deer. I sat underneath the tree. No woman is worth all that trouble. And so I just rested and helped him carry it back. And the elders considered among themselves, who should the young woman marry? Who was the best husband for the young woman? Was it the one who rested under the tree? or the one who came back and caught the deer, and the two came back. And now I'm going to turn this over to you. Which one should the young woman marry, and why? <laughs> and now, Africans are of a legalistic turn of uh, phrase. Mm. And the phrase is, who is, will make the best husband? That's a clue. The one who went and found the deer. I want that man. That's the man I want. <laughs> the one who caught the deer? Yes, the one who caught the deer. Why? The one who decided to go on. Because he didn't give up. Okay. And it's funny yeah. you say. Anybody else? Uh, any uh, yeah. advocates for the young man who sat under the tree? No. Oh, yeah. I'll go for him. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, now you have a reason why. Because... Because he actually helped the friend bring it home, you know, it's without him, the deer would still be out in the forest. Uh, and I'm particularly impressed that this young man did not try and say, I deserve to marry the girl, but my friend went out and uh, he was the one who caught the deer. So this is a man who's honest uh, and who uh, understands the importance of friendship. 
Okay, so uh, he's obviously learned his lesson, uh, and I would say he definitely should be given the chance to marry the girl. Um, I'll go with the guy who sat under the tree, okay. because because you know the chief felt that he's not going to be running behind any woman. When he can let go of the deer, he let go of any woman. So he's the best man for my daughter, because he won't go behind any other woman. So I go with the second guy. Who sat under the tree? You must That's my verdict. Okay, <laughs> you must have been okay. I'm going to because uh, for time uh, sake, unless anybody yeah. has a, a particularly burning a thing. Because uh, uh, first of all, um, Roger, you gave a, an aspect to the answer that I didn't know about, and uh, so that's new to me and shows that discussing this story leads new insights, right? Particularly to relationships. Well, the elders conferred with one another, and then they turned to the young uh, man, man and the father and the daughter, and he said, we, we, this is our judgment. First of all, we judge that the father was a foolish one by giving almost an impossible task for somebody to uh, accomplish so that his daughter could get married. But we, the one who shall marry the young woman, the best husband, is the young man who sat underneath the tree. The reason for this is, well, the other one was stubborn. He wouldn't give up. If his wife, if he married that woman and they had an argument, and there's always arguments, why he would not listen to her. He would be never listen to her words. And they would always be coming to us to, to settle disputes. But the other one is more reasonable. He knew when something was too much. Yes, he wants to marry the young woman, but he also knew that there are limits. And so therefore, this kind and gentle young man is the best husband for the young woman. And so the wedding was celebrated and all enjoyed. But this story is told to this day. And to this day, there are still those who argue, the one under the tree, no, the one who brought back the deer. And I can tell you, this is true because we've had that in this story. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very good. Very good. Uh, however, we've got to be careful, Norman, because um, we are outnumbered. Uh, there's a lot more women on this than there are us. So, however, you know, <clears throat> that's, it's good. This is where, you know, the men, yeah, we're going to be the husbands. So that, that's great. Yeah, excellent. Well, I like still that. like the idea of a thoughtful, listening uh, person, and yeah. it's something we can all... Now, the funny thing is my friend, uh, um, Laura, is the same uh, mind, it's the one who caught the deer, the one who, who should be rewarded. And there's to be something said for both of those. So thanks mm. very much for, uh, for listening to the story. Yeah. I was just about to say, but Sri Vidya has beaten me to it, to say, of course, they should have asked the daughter. It should be absolutely her decision uh, and got nothing to do yeah. with the father uh, uh, or the elders, for that matter, you know. But uh, yeah. perhaps within that community, that is not the way that it's done, which is tough on the daughters. Uh, I am working on a version where it's a young woman who gives the answer. Mm. And, um, but, you know, there's only so far that you can bend a story sometimes. And then the sense that touches in on the appropriation. When you take a story from another culture, what can you do to it that still respects the values from which it came and yep. our own personal values uh, yep. in our own culture? That's, I'd love to get into that with you right now, but I think we should save that for the, uh, the 15th. I think it's yep. great we've had this as you know, uh, has popped up uh, because it really is a, uh, an issue that we need to perhaps think about more uh, seriously and consequentially um, uh, in the times that we live. So this is great. We're going to move on to uh, Priya, who has a story for us. Yes. Hi, Priya. How are you? Yeah, good. I'm good. Hi. And I work as a teacher. I just tell uh -huh. stories to my family and to my uh, kids in the school and that's it i don't have any i don't have a large <laughs> crowd for myself but then uh, 
but then more than telling stories i would like to listen to stories because i change myself into a kid i answer the questions when they ask i keep doing all that so i always love to listen to stories more than to telling stories well that's great what what age kids are you actually working with priya classes 1 to 5 yeah excellent excellent okay so we're really glad uh, and you're also making your debut here uh, this evening so thank you very much so yeah, why don't you share with us your story yeah so this is a turkish story okay i just read it in the internet so then i would like to share it to you okay one day king caliph disguised himself as an ordinary traveler and stepped out of his palace to see how his people fared along his country he he got on his horse he mounted on his horse and he went trak 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 all throughout his country then a few miles away from the city of basora he met an old man beggar beggar man on along the road side and asking for arms please arms please he cried king caliph took out few coins from his pocket and gave it to the beggar then he was about to leave but his humanity stopped he got down from his horse went near the beggar and asked him where are you traveling to and the beggar said i am going to the city of basora then the king helped him to climb the horse and he also both of them and off they rode into the city of basora when the destination came the king turned back to the old beggar man and said dismount yourself the i ha- i shall leave you here now the beggar had his turn he said dismount myself you dismount yourself the horse is mine he said now the king got angry he said what you miserable beggar don't you know that i have helped you yeah but then now he said we both are strangers here in this place we both are new to this place people only people will believe me only because i am a old poor old lame beggar man now the king didn't know what to do now he thought as a king he can throw him into the gutters but then the king didn't want to do it because he didn't want to make that poor old man cry all his, all his life long then he thought maybe he can give him large amount huge amount of money to him but then the king thought if i do that the uh, the old beggar will be encouraged to cheat someone like this in the same way so the king didn't want to do that then he thought okay let me take to the court of basora let me take to the judge and i will do how the city of basora judge deals with justice so off both of them went to the court now the court was happening and the first case was called the first case was between the oil merchant and the porter the porter had a gold coin in his hands and said the coin is mine your judge the coin is mine he cried then the judge turned to the oil merchant and asked what is your verdict the oil merchant said judge your honor this coin belongs to me i used to carry it wherever i go i used to have it always with me that coin is mine he said now the judge said both of you do you have any witness both of them said no then the judge said keep the coin on my table and return back tomorrow now the caliph wondered what kind of a judge is he how is going to render justice to both of them then the second case was called the judge asked what is your trade the writer said i am a writer and i lost my book of learning this morning when i went out of the house now that tailor who has my book who has my book claims to be his own i know that is my book he cried now the judge asked do you have any witness both of them said no now the judge said please leave the book on my table and return back tomorrow now king caliph wondered what a strange kind of justice he is going to render to both of them now it was caliph's turn so he came now the judge asked uh, why are you here 
For what you have come here? From where are you? He asked. The caliph said, I am a good traveler, you, your honor. And you know, while I was traveling, I found this bigger man. I helped him to climb the horse and I helped him to reach the city of Basura. But now he claims that the horse is his own. And how is that possible? He asked. Now, the judge turned to the beggar and asked, uh, what is your verdict? The beggar said, no, the horse is mine. The horse is mine, my lord. You know, I, I had raised him from when he was young. You know, I see I'm an old, lame beggar man. I, I, wherever I travel, I need my horse. He started to cry just to create sympathy to the judge. Now, the judge said, please leave the horse in the court and return back tomorrow. Now, King Caliph thought, my goodness, is he a good justice? What is going to see a good judge? What is going to render? But next day morning, Caliph was in the early hours before the court opened. When the court opened promptly. The first case was called oil merchant and the porter. The, uh, the judge called the oil merchant and said, here, here is your coin. Please take it and depart from here. And then he turned back to the porter and said, you have lied. You have lied. So uh, he called his soldiers and said, please give him lashes on his leg. Then the second case was called. The second case was between the writer and the tailor. The writer, he said, writer, this book of learning belongs to you. You please take it and depart. Then he called the, he called the tailor and said, you have stealed someone else's property. That is not right. Give him 10, 20 lashes on his hands and send him off. And then it was the turn of the caliph. He called the caliph and said, Good traveler, the horse belongs to you. The horse belongs to you. You please take your horse and leave, depart. And then he turned back to the beggar and said, This is how you show the gratitude to the people who have helped you? This is the way you show? Now he said, Put him into the jail and do not leave him, allow him outside. Now, caliph wondered. How the judge has given the righteous judgment? How did he find all the three cases? Now, he thought, let, him wait, let me wait outside the court's room and wait for the judge, uh, judge to come back and I will get to know what he, has, how, what he has done to find all these cases. Now, when he came out, Caliph revealed himself as the king of uh, king of Turkish and he told him, you know, you have given the righteous judgment and how did you find it? Now the judge gave all the answers and now he said, simply superb, your, your wisdom is beyond everything. Come on, I love to be called you as the grand Kadi, grand judge of Turkey. Now the question is for you. Tell me how he solved all the three cases for you all. Can I guess? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, the oil merchant, because the coin was oily. Yes. So he knew that was, I mean, I haven't heard the story before. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a spoil spot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, there was uh, in the hands of the fingers of the, of the writer, there's probably some ink mark or something. So he knew that the book belonged to him. Just a guess. And the third one was, he said, uh, the beggar was lame. So how can a lame man bring up a horse? So he said, <laughs> these are my answers. Any guesses? <laughs> do. Okay. Now, the judge, that day he went home. Okay. He put the coin in a bowl of water. And next day morning, he saw the small droplets of oil on the top of the water. And he found, because he remembered that the oil merchant said, I used to carry it wherever I go. So then he understood that. it was, And he said, I had it for a long time. So it should be oily. Uh, ma'am, Jima ma'am was partially right. Uh, then the book of writings, it belonged to that uh, writer because, see, whenever you use pages the more we are interested we used to underline and keep it and highlight and keep it 
so when you examine the, that book those book which was mostly used those pages which are highlighted and spotted were about the writers and the scholars so then he came to know that it be that it belonged to, uh, duties about the writers and scholars so he came to know that that book belonged to the writer the third one the horse usually the horse neighs and put his heads out when he sees his lovable master so what did the kadi do the judge do is he tied the horse in front of the court where the beggar and the caliph passed through and when when the beggar passed the horse did not turn back or look at him but when uh, caliph came he put out his head and neighed at the caliph now these are all the ways the judge found to be and he said uh, caliph said you are a wonderful judge to be in my court thank you yes okay shades of sherlock holmes there definitely in solving those uh those cases very good very good yes i knew the one about the um, the oil but i didn't get uh, the others very good and uh, kiran has shared yes there's a, a judge uh, oka uh, in japan has a similar story definitely uh, so uh, if you're into um, those kinds of stories about justice you should look for some uh, judge oka all right and see what you double o k a is how you would spell that so good Hi, Ritu. How are you? I'm fine. Namaste to everybody. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Okay. Uh, and uh, tell everybody, where are you speaking to us from? I'm from, from Hyderabad. Mm. And uh, I'm a storyteller. And I use stories as a pedagogical tool for pre-primary as well as for mm. primary classes. Yeah. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, Bloom's taxonomy introduced into the stories uh, for higher order thinking mm. skills. Sure. So I basically try to do a flannel board most of the times. Very rarely do I do an oral one. Mm. Uh, you know, I always have my uh, flannel uh, cutouts with me. Ah. Because it's more interactive. Sure. I find it nice for the little ones to... Mm. No, especially because uh, English is a foreign language, so sure. it takes time to understand. Yeah. yeah, having the visual support is very good. Do you make yes. your own final pictures? Absolutely. Right from scratch, I uh, do that. Ah. I do have a creek, creek cut, you can see. That has started helping me now. <laughs> ah, okay. You're, I'm a yeah, silhouette guy. Definitely. Your creek cut. Okay. Past two years, yeah, one and a half years I've been using it, so it goes much faster. Otherwise, it would take two through two, two, three days to yeah. uh, build up the whole uh, scene. But wow. it helps uh, st my students a lot. I go to various schools. I'm a freelancer. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. it, thank you very a, much. So you're not using the finals for this story? Uh, not today, uh, okay. because it was a riddle, and I felt, you know, it was such a coincidence that um, when the notice for this uh, riddle stories came, I was reading this book. It's such a coincidence. It's the riddle in the tale by Taffy Thompson. Mm. And I just plunged into it. I said, yes, let me apply for it. You know, let me see if I can share one of the stories from there. And I've adapted yeah. it a little bit. Of course. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank <laughs> you for plunging. And we are ready to hear your story. Go. Thank Have you so fun. much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening from India. Good morning for all the from the eastern part of the world. Well, the story is about, it's called Filling the House. You fill the houses, don't you? You all are filling the houses completely with all your love and fun activities in this uh, COVID times. Well, this story is not uh, during the COVID time, certainly, but it is somewhere in the heart of the countryside. There lived a farmer with his wife and three sons. He was very happy. Unfortunately, his wife died and he was left all alone to look after his three sons. The neighbors called in and said, dear farmer, how are you going to take care of these three lads all by yourself? But the farmer was not perturbed. He said proudly, I am a farmer. 
When I plow, I am glad. I work hard all day to care for my lads. And indeed, he took such a good care of his boys. They were all very intelligent and smart kids. The first, the elder two, were even very hardworking. They would go after school and help out their father in the field. But the youngest one was a little different. He would call out his older brothers and say, come on, come on, let's go and play. The eldest brother would say, what do you do whole day, young lad? He had an answer for everything. And he said, I listen to the birds. I sing with the wind. I play with this tiny flute. That's what I love to do. And that's exactly what he did. But he was a smart kid. Well, the farmer realized that he was in the autumn of his years and he would soon, you know, it'll be, you know, he'll be breathing his last breath. So he called in the lawyer to write a will. The lawyer came marching up and said, yes, farmer, how can I help you? He said, well, I have a big, big farmhouse with large number of rooms and the farm itself is very huge. From these three sons, I want to choose a son who would be able to run this whole farmhouse and the farm the way I have done with a lot of care and hard work. So the uh, lawyer said, yes, yes, all right. So what should we, how should we do that? What should I write in the will? He says, well, here are three gold coins. You take these three gold coins and the day I am buried, you know, you tell my children. Your father said, take a gold coin, bring back something that will fill each room from ceiling to the floor. And whoever, you know, achieves this task, We'll inherit the farm. We'll take care of the farm. He wrote in the will, took the three gold coins and went off. In a few years time, you know, unfortunately, the farmer died. The kids were very sad, right? But the day they buried after the ceremony was over, then guess who came? Indeed. It was the lawyer who came walking and he gave one gold coin to each of the three children and said, your father said, take a gold coin each, bring back something that fills the rooms, each room from ceiling to the floor. Whoever achieves will be the right uh, person to inherit this farm. Now, you know, the children were very intelligent. So guess what the first one did, the eldest son. He took the gold coin and he took his horse and carrot, uh, cart, sorry. He took his horse and cart and he went tickerick, 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 tickerick all the way to the town. And he brought, guess what? Second-hand mattresses he got from all the people, you know, who were ready to dispose of their second-hand mattresses. And he got it back, back to the farmhouse. Then he quickly, inside the house, inside the room, he quickly ripped each one of them, chur, 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 and out came the feathers filling each room from ceiling to the floor. Well, the lawyer walked in. He said, indeed, you're smart. And he walked from one room to another. It was filled with lovely feathers. But 
the time he reached the last one. Oops! Oh, because it was such a big farmhouse with many rooms. What had happened to the feathers? They had come to the bottom. Hmm, said the lawyer. I like the idea, young lad, but the room isn't quite full. You fail the task. Let's give the chance to the middle son. The middle son quickly swapped because he was very hardworking. He cleaned up all the feathers. He took his gold coin and he went on his horse, tickety, 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 all the way to the town. And guess what he got? He got somebody saying candy. Well, another try. Somebody else wants to try in the audience. How will candy fill all the rooms? Anyway, what he got was a pack of candles. And he came back to the farmhouse and stood a candle in each one of the rooms and lit them. Right? When the lawyer came, ah, he was delighted. Yes, the room is full of the light of the candle. The next room was full of the light of the candle and so on and so forth. All the rooms were filled from the ceiling to the floor with the light of the candle. But as he went towards the last one, oops, it was pitch dark. What had happened? It had got burnt out. The candle got burnt out. The lawyer said, hmm, I like the idea, young man, but the room isn't quite full. Unfortunately, you failed the task. Let's call the youngest one. Now, the elder two were very worried, you know. He's anyway not at all hardworking. I don't know what he'll do. What will happen to this whole farmhouse and the farm? Who is going to inherit it? The youngest lad. He took the gold coin, sat on his horse, and went tick, 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 all the way to the town. And guess what he got? Come on. I want the audience. Birds, animals. Mm -hmm. All right. Some more? Laughter. <laughs> yes, probably. Let's see. All right. And he got you. Remember what he, his song was? I listen to the birds. I sing to, with the wind. I play my tiny flute. That's what I do. And he went and got a big flute. And he went back to the farmhouse sat cross-legged in the middle of the room and he played his flute. And the melodious music filled each and every corner, each and every room from the ceiling to the floor. The lawyer went listening to this beautiful music of the flute from one room to another, from next room to the next. And do you think he heard it to the last room? Indeed. And the lawyer said, well, I like this idea. And all the rooms are filled with lovely music. You have passed the task and you will take care of the farm. And from that day, the youngest of the three became, he took care of the farm and all the three brothers, they lived happily ever after. So that's the story of filling the house.
Thank you very much, Ritu. It's a great story, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and a good one for a really a kind of problem solving. Uh, I have a, a version uh, that I created here because we have quite a, a number of uh, mothers and child who like to tell stories together. So uh, we did the first version, which is as you had there with sons. And then we did a second version with, I said, what if the uh, now the one who has uh, won the competition uh, grows up and he has three daughters. Uh, yeah, and so we then reinterpreted, reinterpreted the story, uh, but actually incorporating um, uh, the, the music, uh, which you have there already, and the idea of them living together. So um, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but it's very nice. I like the, also the, uh, the little song and the, the flute. I wish I could whistle like that. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for those great suggestions too. I might laugh through. I thought that would be a good, a good one to add in the story as well. Hi, how are you? Great, thank you. How are you all doing? Very good. Well, it's great to have you uh, back. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm speaking from Coimbatore, that is in India, Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Yes, I have been there. So I was actually wearing a, uh, uh, a kurta that I bought while I was there in a sale. Uh, Jeeva was with me when I bought it. So uh, good. I am with you in spirit. So tell us, uh, please you. tell us your story. This is a complete surprise. Uh, I don't know the, the story. So over to you. Thank you for stepping in and. Um, offering to share at such short notice. Yeah, it is an extra more for me too. So, uh, yes. So, Vanakam, uh, Namaste. Hope you're all doing great. So, this story comes from Tamil Nadu in India. So, many, 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 many years before, there lived a king and a queen in a palace. And they had a daughter, a daughter who was the apple of their eyes. She was so beautiful and along with beauty, she had the brains too. She was a beautiful combination of brains and beauty. So she used to help her father in the day-to-day -day affairs of the court. She used to come to the court. She used to sit. She used to listen. She used to help her dad and... Uh, she helped her father in all possible ways in running the kingdom. So as this girl grew up and came of marriageable age, so people and princes from all around India and across the world, they came rushing, seeking her hand in marriage. Because words of her beauty and brain had gone all across the world. She was so beautiful that when she walked through the garden, the flowers would bend down shyly. And when she spoke, everyone listened wide mouthed. So now, kings and princes from far off lands and near off lands, they all came. <laughs> They all came galloping their horses as fast as they could because they didn't want to miss this beautiful girl. But she stopped all of them. She said, please. She told her father, Appa, I would like to marry someone from our own kingdom so that I can continue staying here and I can help the people of our kingdom. I don't want to leave you and Amma and go. And also, I don't want to leave my kingdom. I love my land. I want to be here. So then the king asks, <clears throat> so do you have anyone in mind? No, Appa. I'm yet to find one. Huh? Yet to find one now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Appa. I have a condition. Okay. What is the condition? And then she whispered a condition to her dad. And she told that it be announced all across their kingdom. So the next day, 
Announcers went dum 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 Listen, listen, listen. The princess wants a groom from our own kingdom. Will you be the lucky one? So the princess says, anyone who can come to the palace on 35 legs will be the chosen groom and can marry the princess and will be the next king. Dum 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 the people were all surprised. Hey, 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 did you hear it right? 35? What do they remember? 30? 30? 30? 30? 30? She must be a monster. At night might be she is changing form. She is the blood sucking Dracula might be. 30 pellets. Who are not as 30 pellets? Huh? So then the princess from the far off kingdoms and the near off kingdoms who thought of winning her hand, they all went back rejected. 35 legs. Who on earth has 35 legs? Oh my God. Uh, if I walk on my hands, how many legs will I have? That makes it four. If I go on a horse, four legs of the horse, two legs of mine, four plus two, four plus two, ah, six legs. Ayo, how to have 35 legs? For a long time, people thought of this and then they just let it be. They thought the princess is crazy. She just doesn't want to leave the kingdom. She loves her parents a lot. She just wants to stay here. She's crazy. She's not going to get married. She's going to be here. Forget it. Let's get back to our works. So there there was Dumbaku. Dumbaku was a farmer. He was plowing his field. And he looked. He looked at his birds. He looked at his plow. And then he said, Yes! I am going to go to the palace with 35 legs and I will be the next king. Appa, give me your blessings. Up. His father was like, enough, what are you saying? How will you go with 35 legs? Just watch me. Bless your son. I'm going. So he did go with 35 legs and he was chosen by the princess. Any idea how he went on 35 legs? With all his animals, okay. So can you please tell the calculation, number of animals and his legs and the total count? Uh, mm. And the staff? <laughs> So, uh, four into any number of animals plus two, his legs have to be also counted. So, yes. Yep. <laughs> One of his legs is a walking stick. Two of his own plus four times eight. Uh, four times eight is 32. 32 plus two is 34. One of the legs is a walking stick. <laughs> yes. Four animals plus his two. One animal had a leg missing. One odd leg of his plow. Yes, Smirti is uh, Okay. So uh, I guess there are different permutations and combinations for this. But uh, what my grandfather told me, I will just uh, tell. Uh, so then uh, his two legs, he told of his bullocks. He tied them to his cart. And then uh, he went. So his two blocks, uh, two into uh, four, that is eight legs. His legs, so that is plus two, that is ten. So the wheels of the uh, bullock cart, uh, they have in something it's called the arakal. So that is also a cal leg. So meaning there are lines or spikes in each of the wheels. So 12 into two, that is 24. So 24 plus 8 plus 2. So the maid standing along with the princess said, Hey, she's Mr. Calculation. Uh, that is only 34. She wanted someone uh, with 35 legs who came on 35 legs. 
But the princess said, no, look carefully. He has come on 35 legs. And the 35th leg was the uh, nukal or what that is a Tamil word. Uh, the one in front of the bullock cart, which is used yes, yes, down yes, and yes, stop yes. it. Very so good. that is the 35 legs on which uh, Dumbak came and Dumbak married the princess and they lived happily ever after. Thank you very, very much. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Which, of course, brings us back to, unlike uh, in a Norman story where the, uh, the father was making the conditions, here it was the princess herself who set the, uh, the challenge. And obviously she was keen on a farmer. Uh, and so that's why she said it. So um, it sounds like really the kind of um, the way they set up Brexit to you ask the questions in order to get the answer that you want Lovely, lovely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anglam. I really uh, loved the way you, you told that story. Love, great energy and a, a lovely way to finish. And a perfect way for me, actually, just to kind of work in uh, another plug, as always, for the um, Feast book about um, royals, wise and otherwise, uh, our collection of uh, Asian folk tales on the theme of royalty. Uh, there is a, a, at least one beer bowl story in there, but it's not the one that we heard earlier this evening. So uh, if you're in India, just contact Jeeva directly because she has got, you know, she's beginning, I think, to see some floor space because you are <laughs> to clear some of them. Um, but anywhere else in the world, then um, uh, just uh, drop a mail to uh, Feast and uh, if it's practical for us to post it to you, but it is quite a large and heavy book uh, otherwise, we'll have to send you a, a, a PDF copy or something. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, challenging us uh, with your riddles. That's great. So thank you very much, one and all. We look forward to uh, seeing you again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Bye. And a bye, big bye. hand for all Take our care. fellows this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. Andre, <laughs> bye. Bye.